picturesque Saturday morning in Tuscaloosa as the Ragin' Cajuns are here to play the top team in America. Welcome to SEC Football, presented by Allstate. Tuscaloosa, home of the reigning national champions, and it is a winning tradition that started nearly a century ago with this guy, their head coach, Wallace Wade. His team won three national titles, but then he surprised everyone up and left for Duke, but the winning tradition continued. Paul William Bryant, the bear. He's got a museum, a hall, a drive, even a stadium named after him. His voice still echoes through it on game days. But those six national championships, they thought that would never be matched. Until this guy came along, he's also won six national championships, five in the last nine years here in T-Town. And as you see him on the field today, many think this is his best team ever. This is the 67th time he's been ranked number one in the country. No coach in college football has ever done that before. First time that the Ragin' Cajuns and the Crimson Tide have met since 1990 when the Tide went down to Lafayette to play them there when they were known as USL. Alabama 8-0 all time against this school from Louisiana with Billy Napier now coaching the team. That's Kyle Fowl, the kicker, kicking it deep to Josh Jacobs and to Brian Robinson. Great crowd on a beautiful day. It's a short kick as they kick away. And that's Miller Forrestal that will take it just short of the 30-yard line, Chris Button. Taylor, Nick Saban trying to remind his team this week not to get complacent. A couple players told me he was tougher on them this week than any other week this season. The very first thing he brought up was... Virginia Tech losing to Old Dominion last week. How intense is practice this week? Well, on a scale of 1 to 10, the players say practice is a 10. By the time they get out here for game day, that's like a 5 to them. Stitch is just amazing. The competition they face on Tuesday is stiffer than what they see on a Saturday. Pistol set for Tua Tonga Bailoa with Damian Harris standing behind him. They are going to try to run the football between the tackles today to pick up a four. Two is the top rated passer in America. 20 of his 31 drives have ended with a touchdown this season. Literally, we've seen an offensive explosion here in Tuscaloosa. And by all accounts, it's owing to the quarterback play that they've gotten from number 13. Efficient, deadly, mobile, and accurate. He gives you all that you're looking for. And now he throws a little swing pass to Harris out of the backfield. And Damian, who can do it all, Everyone says the best all-purpose back on the field is right at the sticks as Ladarius Kidd makes the tackle. An emphasis all week, Stinch, on playing power football this week. Only power football. Situational football here on a short yardage. And there's Tonga Bailoa following Lester Cotton and Ross Piercebaker. And it's a first down for Alabama at the 39-yard line. And we can talk about, and it has been dissected, Tonga Bailoa's skill set unto himself. But more than anything, he's been able to ignite the talent that has resided on this roster. It's the distribution of the football that has been frightening. When you look at the offensive production and the many different ways that this offense can hurt you. Again, Harris with a hole and past the 45-yard line. Tackled by Tariq Miller. Harris second all-time in yards per carry at the Capstone. The senior from Richmond, Kentucky. Hasn't had as many carries as your typical senior tailback, but with 64 yards a day, he passes Sherman Williams, 12th all-time in rushing. And again, a fake this time to Damian, and it's Jerry Judy wide open across the middle. Somehow keeps his feet. Look at this athleticism down to the 20-yard line. If you take out the short yardage play, we've seen two called runs. RPO, you got your quarterback looking into the secondary. And this is the proposition that you have defensively versus the Crimson Tide. Do you want to load up and play run? Or are you going to play coverage versus the playmakers that they have on the perimeter? And it quite literally is pick your poison. 35 yards for the sophomore 
from Deerfield Beach. Now back to the ground, and Harris will get a couple. It was interesting in talking with Coach Saban yesterday. As he was saying, look, there's, there's really hasn't been a ton of evolution in offensive football when it comes to running. There's only about five different plays that you can call. But the way that you get there and how you get there is important. Sometimes you just have to call it and run it. We've seen so far the zone to the left three times already in this game behind Big Jonah Williams and Lester Cotton. Big to Harris. Another wide open receiver inside the 10 yard line. This is Henry Ruggs. It's pick your poison with these Alabama receivers. If you've been watching Jalen Waddle return punch, you're thinking, man, this is the guy, it's the fastest guy on the team. Well, actually, this guy is Henry Ruggs, and Jerry Judy is right there neck and neck, too. You put them on the grass, cleats, and a jersey on, and they all look crazy fast. It's all relative to whoever's chasing you. What's been exciting from an offensive standpoint is the ability to get multiple receivers incorporated into the pass. Tight ends at the bottom of your screen, and it's Jacobs following them into the end zone. Eight plays, 72 yards. That is what fans are used to. That looks like Alabama football. And that's what the sideline wanted it to look like, too. Let's get some runs in there. Establish that early. But be able to set up what you want to do off of that pass action. And because of it, it's going to give it all the more teeth down the stretch. You have to sometimes just grind your teeth in and say, we're running it, whether it looks good or not defensively. All of this is extra point is good. Josh Jacobs after Damian Harris and Jerry Judy helped them get down there. Is into the end zone already. Seven zip tied. Crimson Tide so far this season have been prolific on offense. Have scored a touchdown on the opening drive in all five games that they've played. And look at the point differential. It is kind of absurd, isn't it? And the idea to maintain focus throughout these contests ultimately becomes one of the larger challenges for this football team because they have been so efficient with their opening possessions and then the ensuing possessions to keep your edge sharp over four quarters. Louisiana Lafayette gets it at the 25-yard line. Let's go back to the studio for an update in Arlington with DirecTV. More for your college football thing. look good. I know the score may not reflect it last week, stench here in Tuscaloosa, but they have been competitive with Clemson and Alabama so far this season as Andre Nunez fakes a handoff and swings it out of the backfield to Jamarcus Bradley. He will pick up one. Nunez ranks eighth in the country in completion percentage so far this season. Four touchdowns and one interception for the Raging Cajuns. off that goes to Bradley out of the backfield and Bradley's past the 30 yard line for a handful more as Trayvon Diggs was there to help him out of bounds third down and speaking with the Raging Cajuns coaching staff yesterday they're going to want to try to maintain some possession you know they recognize what they're up against in this game so to be able to extend drives even to get conversions on these third downs critical not just for scoring opportunities, but just for time of possession. Here come the Tide. Bubble to Regus over his head. Three and out for UL. You can see right away. Sometimes when you're setting up a screen, you have to slow down the rush just a little bit. That time, the entire defensive front right on top of Nunez as he's trying to deliver it. Anthony Jennings getting there. And he just had too much. It was too high, and regardless, Diggs in position to make the play. When you talk to these defenders here at Alabama, 
one of the elements that they talk about what it takes to get on the field defensively for the Crimson Tide is study. They were ready. And it's blocked. And the Crimson Tide jump on it inside the 15-yard line. As the play's made there by Derek Keith. Snap a little bit low and you're going rugby style. Great job by Keith adjusting his rush. Because you see, these punters, when they're going for a rugby style kick, they're going to work to one side of the formation. That time, it could not have laid out any better for Keith and his rush. He ended up working right in to the oncoming defender. And Keith able to get the block and an offense that doesn't need any help with an incredibly short field on its second possession. One way they can improve here in Tuscaloosa Stench is by blocking punts. Their first of the season. Harris straight ahead into the sea of Crimson Tide offensive linemen, and he is still gaining momentum inside the 10-yard line. You know, Taylor, you said earlier about Damian Harris. Maybe not as many touches. There might not be a more overlooked and underappreciated talent in this conference, and it's a function of the rest of the playmakers on this roster as complete a back as you're going to find in college football number 34. Just about everyone will tell you he is a legitimate pro prospect. Six on the last. Carry as a flag comes in. This has been one thing that's bothered Coach Saban. False start. Offense. Number 71. Five-yard penalty. Second down. Goes on Pierce Baker, the first-team All-American center is Crimson Tide is committing just about eight penalties a game. And Coach Saban said the frustration he's had is that some of them are mental errors. Second and nine. A piece of confusion there as Tunga Valoa throws it to the end zone, but no problem. Henry Ruggs, touchdown. Just when you think that there's a misstep, this offense has a way of covering things right back up. Last week versus AM, a negative yardage play, second and 10 plus. You end up ripping off a big play here. You run heavy play action. You spin Tungavailoa out of the pocket. And once again, able to find another one of his weapons on the perimeter. All of this is extra point is good. The block punt gives Alabama their 11th drive this season in under one minute. 55 seconds. That's tops in all of college football. SEC Network Football is presented by Allstate. Are you in good hands? Pictures of Bryant Denny Stadium, how it's changed through the years as you see what it looked like just more than 50 years ago. It looked like that with one upper deck for the longest time before they built the second upper deck just before the turn of this century. And in the last 18 to 20 years, all of a sudden you have four upper decks, a totally enclosed stadium, and the best home field advantage in all of Power 5 football. No one has a better winning percentage here than the Crimson Tide. And now let's look at the mayhem moment brought to you by Allstate. Got to go with the block punt, right? And it happened early. This is for a team that doesn't need a ton of assistance trying to put the football away after a three and out, and you don't get out. You end up giving the ball on a short field for the most explosive offense that they've ever seen here at Alabama and up two scores early. Can't afford to do it. That goes without saying. Billy Napier, who's incredibly familiar with this program, it's those mistakes in special teams, especially early, that sets that tenor on what is already an uphill climb. And toss ahead to Malone, and he's got no place to go. Anthony Jennings and Mac Wilson in the backfield. Billy Napier, as you mentioned, is in his first year as the head coach of the Ragin' Cajuns, was a wide receiver coach for Coach Saban at Alabama for four years. Did spend some time at Arizona State most recently, former Clemson offensive coordinator. He said he's been on the other side of these matchups. No matter what you say, it's not the same 
hopefully we can take advantage of that, unfortunately, for the Ragin' Cajuns, six minutes in, already down two touchdowns. That last play, Quinton Williams was banged up a bit. Interior defensive lineman for the Crimson Tide who's had an outstanding start to the season. Nunez flushed out. And he is leveled right in front of the 35-yard line as a flag will come in. That was Dylan Moses. They're going to look at this for targeting. As you see the officials conferring Dylan Moses with a vicious hit right here. Personal foul. Targeting. Defense number 32. 15-yard penalty. Out of night first down. Previous players under further review. Yeah. And this has become, I think, more prevalent, where the flag comes out and then let replay take a close look at it. Uh, you know, they're gonna, they may say that it's with the crown of the helmet. You know, to me, I don't see a target there. They're going to say there's a launch, perhaps. That's one of the indicators. But to me, I don't see forcible contact. I mean, that oftentimes what you'll see is a helmet to helmet, and the head will snap back. But to me, He's got his head up. He can see what he hits. Yes, there is contact to the head or neck area, but there was also contact to his shoulder pad. In my book, that flag comes out. You want to make sure you get replay a chance to get it. There's no foul for targeting. Yeah. I think that's exactly what... Number 32 can remain in the game. ...what the crews are doing, and it makes sense. You know, you want to increase safety, sure. So if there's any chance, throw the flag and give replay a chance to take a second look. And sometimes it takes that. This is happening in real time. These guys are flying around. Dylan Moses especially. But a clean tackle and a good reversal. And it seemed like it was accidental, right? Because Nunez is, was moving, maneuvering yeah. into Moses, and that's what created any kind of contact between the two. But Moses remains in the game. Joy to be around. Sophomore from Baton Rouge. We enjoyed eating lunch with him yesterday. So now after all of that, it's third and 11 for Nunez. Muddy pocket, and it looked like that ball was altered fourth down. It was Anthony Jennings who has lived in the backfield in early going. The difficulty you'll always have is it's just a matter of time. So if it's slow developing, nowhere to go with the football as Jennings gets there, right as Nunez releases the football, Jennings lamenting not getting a number he's trying to pad that box score and build up his stat sheet you're not gonna have a ton of time if you're a quarterback versus this defense with its speed that clock has got to be running it needs to be clicking faster than just every second you see three raging cajuns in for protection in front of reese burns after the last one was blocked and this one barely gets off and waddle will field it at the 37 yard line this guy can fly as you see the big hit as he comes around the corner, he looks for daylight in front, cuts it back to the middle. Watch out. See ya. 63 yards. And a little help from Jalen Moody, who depleted a raging Cajun. talk to coaches all the time and they'll say look you want every possession to end in a kick not so far in this contest you got one setting up a short field to an eventual touchdown and now a punt return for a touchdown Saban mentioned he wanted the punting and the punting game to improve Alabama hasn't had a chance to punt it away but they have certainly taking advantage of their two opportunities to defend and receive punts. All of us has been a busy man. That's the fifth non-offensive touchdown of the season for the Crimson Tide. Their first punt return. The speedster, the true freshman from Houston, Texas, all over the Raging Cajuns. During that Alabama punt return, there was a pretty nasty-looking block. Jackson Ladner, the deep snapper, 
You see him taking a shot, just clean shot, incidentally. You see that? That's a right shoulder to left shoulder block. Head in front, clean but violent. To set up that waddle return. Old Jackson Ladner shook it off nicely. He's been out there for two plays. It has not gone well for the punting unit for the Rage of Cajuns. Moody, a freshman from Conway, South Carolina, already making his presence felt. We haven't even played seven minutes in the Crimson Tide. Already up three touchdowns, blocking a punt, taking a punt back to the house, and having a long, sustained drive. Have a look at their offensive numbers, Taylor. I mean, they are somewhat depressed when you think about it. 21 points. And it's been somewhat muted from a total offense standpoint. I could not be more facetious. Third time in five games. 21 or more in the first quarter for the Crimson Tide as Trey Regis stands behind Nunez in pistol set. Rodriguez will get three. And you know what the challenge, of course, for Regas, who is a good-looking back and had a 100-yard game last week versus Coastal Carolina. The difficulty is going to be running space. I not going to be able to create it formationally. He's a downhill runner, big body, 227 pounds, but there's just not going to be a lot of room to get ahead of steam going. And when you do, you're often met by multiple defenders. Regis again, that's the 30 yard line where he'll set up third and short as Christian Miller comes in to make the tackle. Crimson Tide defense has had a lot of attrition in the last two years, losing 16 players in two years to the National Football League draft. It's a staggering number, but you can reserve your sympathies for other programs because what would have been depth players that may be frontline players like a Quinnen Williams, who's been a defensive player of the week the first four weeks of this season, are still incredibly good football players filling the voids of the Duran Paynes. Third and four to take the toss, and the throw out of the backfield is Louisiana's first first down. It was fumbled briefly, and Jalen Williams makes that catch as Bradley jumps on it. It's a forced fumble by Trayvon Diggs. It's the second of the season. See, Mac Wilson was coming off the edge. Able to just leak right out into the flats there. Ball security being a concern. Great job by Jamarcus Bradley. Mac Wilson, another in a long line of excellent inside linebackers. We've already mentioned Dylan Moses with the shot on Nunez earlier. Mac Wilson active at linebacker. And a snap. Tackle just past the 40 yard line as Christian Miller's one of those guys in there helping to make the stop. Miller's had a nice career for the Crimson Tide, but really has come on as a senior. Torres Bicep in the 2017 season opener versus Florida State. You see his bio blast. Corey Miller, by the way, good friend of mine, Stint. She has the greatest Twitter handle Pastor of Pain. Second and nine after the one-yard carry. Make the toss, make the handoff, and down you go. Big loss back inside the 30-yard line as Xavier McKinney claps his hands. It just can't be slow developing. And there's a lot of ball handling on this play. Trying to catch the tied eyes in the offensive backfield just doesn't work out. McKinney in there first. Dylan Moses in there to clean things up at the back end. The ball has to come out quickly. Otherwise, it's just a matter of time before the tie defense collapses on it. Two fakes. That's one too many, it turns out. Okay, and a safety blitz for a sack against Kellen Mon last week. Now third and 19. Catch made up at the 35-yard line. That'll be fourth down after a five-yard completion to Jamarcus Bradley. Freddie Jennings a little slow getting up after that last play. But yet again, forcing another punt, which has been an adventure so far. Took it back to the house the first time. Has already shown flashes even before that return of the deuce, David Palmer, Avi Arenas, 
one of the best returners in school history as they punt that one away from him. Regulation size. Go route. But where I'll fight! Wisely, Louisiana Lafayette punts it away from Mr. Waddle, a 33-yard punt, and to a Tunga Bailoa, who we haven't seen in a while because his special teams unit has been doing the job, is back on the field. SEC Player of the Week last week. 387 yards passing and four touchdowns in three quarters against the Aggies. Jacobs. That is a big man. Bulls his way ahead for a first down as the flag comes in. It's Hubert Owens, today's referee. Personal foul, face mask. Defense number six, 15-yard penalty added to the end of the run. First down. Senior from New Orleans, then. Corey Turner's just trying to come up and run support, gets a handful of Josh Jacobs' face mask. And as you mentioned, that's a big man and a physical runner. And you're just coming up there. He actually overran that tackle. He's trying to reach out, tack on even more yards on what was otherwise an impressive run. Bailoa wants to take a shot. He's got a wide open receiver inside the 20. It's Judy again. Another flag down, though, back near the original line of scrimmage. Personal foul, targeting, defense number 17. Half the distance to the goal from the end of the run. First down, previous players under review. So it's a 24-yard completion, on, and then on top of what would be a penalty on Chauncey, Chauncey Manick, the defensive lineman for the Raging Cajuns. Chauncey Manick was a guy that came up on our call, shows up on the tape too, and you're going to run right into the passer and hit him in the head. Now, people are going to say, is that very violent? And it's not. And I would tend to agree that is there forcible contact here? There's contact. You know, forcible becomes somewhat of a subjective term. We've seen two targeting flags come out in this game, one that was ruled, um, overruled on the field saying that it was not in fact targeting. I'd be surprised review, they said two. There's no foul for targeting. Number yeah. 17 remains in the game. First down, Alabama. And so that's replay official Ron Leatherwood who's overturned two calls. And I couldn't agree with more with both of them. And you look at it, and I also agree with the flag coming out. Just give them a chance to look at it. As you see, Tonga Vailoa dropping it in there. This is something that offensive coordinator, play caller Mike Loxley talked about. His ability to feather passes in. It's not just the deep ball. It's dropping it in over the heads of linebackers and coverage underneath. He has that ability as well. Jacobs patient and fights his way down to the 11-yard line for eight more. Junior from Tulsa, Oklahoma, changing numbers to number eight, splitting time with Damian Harris, Najee Harris. We should see a lot of Brian Robinson today, maybe even Jerome Ford and Ronnie Clark. The Tide have six tailbacks that have taken at least four carries so far this season. Also versatile, but Jacob's probably the best receiver among that running back group. Another option is Tunga Baloa will keep himself taking on defenders to the doorstep inside the two. Able to get push at the point of attack. See Jonah Williams, left tackle, climbing up to the second level. And Tunga Vailoa, he's more than a capable runner and a physical runner at that. Oftentimes finishing his runs, falling forward. Snap, Jacobs straight ahead, no problem. Josh Jacobs with his fourth rushing touchdown on this early season. And already a couple here today time nice patience once again by number eight and you look at him and you say there's not a lot that flashes when you watch number eight when you look from a stature standpoint is he outstanding not when you've had running backs in one heisman here there's six four 
you look at Josh Jacobs, and you're going, what about this guy's exemplary? It's a well-rounded game. Not just similar to Damian Harris. Is there any way that this team could possibly be better? Nick Saban says there is. We'll go through that coming up, but they are rolling already. Uh, I'd appreciate it if you would, you know, sort of look at some of the things we didn't do so well I, and write about that. So maybe I can show it to the players and say, look here, man. Here's something you can do better. All right, see you later. Well, that is a challenge for sure when your team is already up 28 nothing, and your average margin of victory on the season has been more than 40 points, and you're clearly – the top program in college football, but we did come up with a few, which we'll show you momentarily. And Chris Button has a few headlines to go over. We tried to give Saban some billboard material, so here's what we came up with. Our first one, two opposed to 0.0, .0 QBR in fourth quarters this season, because he hasn't played in a fourth quarter this season. How about our next one? AP voter not convinced Bama deserves number one ranking. That's because there's one voter in Kansas City who's putting Clemson number one. And this third one, my favorite, Saban gives up Little Debbie's for Twinkies, which, of <laughs> course, we are joking. He is still enjoying his oatmeal cream pies. We tried, Coach. There's not that much we could come up with. That, that would be a huge story in the state of Alabama, would, if it were true. They would, that would show up on a Richter scale. People would not know what to do with themselves. <laughs> to Otunga Bailoa has to, some new work to do as we got a new quarterback in. This is Levi Lewis straight ahead to Trey Ragus, and Ragus takes it past the 40-yard line. That's a first down run for the this, sophomore from New Orleans. Did you take a look at Lewis, the sophomore from Baton Rouge? And this is not an indictment on Nunez. This is what they've done all season long. Billy Napier has an idea. The quarterbacks are aware of it. They know that they're going to substitute in. So we knew that we would see Levi Lewis at some point. It's not circumstantial. This is part of the way that they've approached their offense all season. backfield will go one on one to the sideline it's incomplete as Sertan is right there with Jamarcus Bradley another young player in the Alabama secondary there's a lot of concern coming into the season as you see Sertan in coverage left hand Bradley throughout that route but for such a young player the stage hasn't seemed too big for him and to be able to earn your way out onto the field given the level of talent on defense, speaks to his skill set. That's the 45 for Ragus for six. You can stream college football all season long on ESPN+. Plus. So start your free trial today by downloading the ESPN app or visiting ESPNplus.com. We have some outstanding college football games coming up throughout the day, a few in the Southeastern Conference. I'm excited about that prime game tonight we have on SEC Network between South Carolina and Kentucky out of conference, Notre Dame, Stanford, and Ohio State, Penn State. It's third and five for Lewis. As he throws an incomplete pass, he was looking for Malone, and you see the finger wave from Shaheem Carter. Get what you're doing, though. Makes sense. Lewis getting in there. Move the pocket. We've already seen on third downs as defenders collapse around the passers for the Raging Cage. And previously, it was Nunez. This time on Levi Lewis's series. Move that pocket. Get him out on the edge. Just not enough. And you see the secondary capable of breaking and getting yet another pass breakup. Better than any other defense in the country on the Crimson Tide. Just had one block and one taken back for a touchdown as a flag comes in here. And as Waddle makes the fair catch at the 15 yard line. Appears to be on the Raging Cajuns. Illegal formation, offense, number 48 not on the line of scrimmage. 
five-yard penalty from the previous spot. Replay fourth down. Why not give Waddle one more chance after that punt return he took back earlier? Yeah, it's not about the yardage. You're right. It's the other crack at him. Every time you punt it away, this is where you really start exploring just how good of a directional punting team you really are. Don't get it anywhere near number 17, especially after what he's already done to you early. In the SEC, we've been saying don't kick it to Debo for a few years. I think they're going to be the, saying the same thing about this young man as his career continues. Would have had two punt returns on the season. He had one called back against Louisville. Another fair catch that he'll make at the 20-yard line. Let's get to know Waddle a little bit better, the true freshman from Episcopal High School in Houston. Runs a 4-3-40, nicknamed the Magic Man, and you saw why with that great return earlier. Man, a Whataburger patty melt sounds great right now. Ah, you know, I like everything about the kid except for that call right there. Are you sure the patty melt of all the great Whataburger? It goes with the, it's fine. It's working for him, clearly. Guess who's staying in Tuscaloosa for the duration of the 2018 season? And look at the ovation that Jalen Hurts gets as he appears in his fifth college football game this year. Slings one through the middle, and it's dropped by Judy. Good pass. I think Jerry Judy might have felt Blair Brooks coming over from his safety position right there towards the tail end. Short on that one, just a tad. Interesting, though, because in this game, Alabama has said they want to run the football and have on first downs. Jalen Hurts and the element of his game that they want to evolve, that he wants to evolve, is his passing. First play, a downfield pass. Now this play hit in the backfield is Najee Harris. As Harris will lose a few as Chauncey Manning comes in to make the tackle, and Jonah Williams is a little slow to get up. A little bit rolled up towards the end of that. Jedrick Wills played very well at right tackle, was beat right away. On the inside, Jonah Williams, who is as bad a complete an offensive lineman as you'll find in football. Raved about him this week as you watched him on film. So back to Hurts for a second. This his third year of college football. 26 and 2 as a starter the last two seasons. With another whistle. Coach Saban said this is unprecedented in the game to have a guy that started every game except one the last two years lead your team to two national championship appearances and then have to go back to the bench you, you see why with the way two is playing but there's no foul on the play third down but for someone to take that mat and take their role as the second string quarterback the entire team has appreciated the way that Jalen Hurts has handled it there is, I think, universal respect for number two for Alabama by the fans, by his teammates, and their coaching staff. They recognize what he's meant to this program. More on him coming up in just a minute as he'll have a third down as the second quarter starts. All Crimson Tide already against the Raging Cajuns. What a first quarter that was as the tide already rolling up 28 zip as we're here in T-Town and, and stench transferring has been a big topic in college football. Many wondered if Alabama would have to deal with that. The answer is they don't, but others like Clemson and Oklahoma State do. Yeah, they don't currently anyway, but the way the rules read and the impact that it can have, obviously other programs dealing with it. The red shirt rule, the interface of having four games in play. And how about this throw from the guy that sticks it out in Tuscaloosa on a third and 13 to Waddle to move the chains. Nice hook up downfield. So in this possession, two downfield throws for Jalen Hurts. People are going to ask, you know, why do you stick around? This is the guy's offensive player of the year. Led him to a national title game twice. And it wasn't on the field when they won it this past season. How do you stick around? He wants to grow and evolve. 
at the quarterback position. 24 yards for Waddle. Najee Harris with the carry, Chris. Josh Jacobs told me this week that you will not find a player in college football that has handled the situation as gracefully as Jalen Hurts has. He's been the ultimate teammate. You already see that down here today when Jalen Waddle had the touchdown. Jalen was the first one to come congratulate him. Even the fan base, they gave him a standing ovation when he came in and at the end of the quarter, guys. Yeah, and that was. That was a big ovation that he received on this second and six as plenty of time stands tall and delivers a bullet to Ruggs. And look at this space, and the guy flies into the end zone. This team is outrageous with its talent. Jonah Williams, the All-American left tackles, out of the game. He was out of the game in the national title game in the second half. Got a little bit of pressure from Jalen Hurts' blindside as a right-handed passer. He stands in there, off of the play fake. He's downfield looking for Ruggs, takes a shot, delivers a strike. Ruggs wide open in the secondary. Runs right through three would-be tacklers in the Raging Cajuns and ends up in the end zone. 54 yards, Rubs took a jet sweep, 57 yards against the Aggies last week, and it's already 35 nothing. Tell you what, this guy, Jalen Hurts to Henry Ruggs. Hurts looks better as a passer this year than he did the last two years. Dan Enos, the quarterback coach, might have something to do with that all time. Can't find anything wrong with this performance so far from the Crimson Tide on a perfect day at the Capstone. Number one team in the country has dominated all competition in 2018 in all five games they've played here in the month of September. Arkansas awaits next week in Fayetteville at the same time. Then Missouri's here. Then it's the Tennessee Volunteers. How can any of those teams keep it close? As Calais comes out from the one, and he's tackled just past the 20-yard line. Coming up at 4 Eastern in week 5 of the college football season, it's number 10 Auburn on the other side of the state hosting the Golden Eagles. The SEC Network alternate channel has Tennessee State and Vanderbilt in Nashville. Then South Carolina takes on number 17 Kentucky at 7.30 in our SEC Saturday night matchup presented by Holiday Inn Express. You can go to SEC Network dot com slash channel and all games are also streaming live on the ESPN app. Matt Stinchcomb told you that Billy Napier likes to run his quarterbacks in and out so Nunez is back in after Levi Lewis had the last series. This is Regis with another flag coming in that gets a couple. Illegal formation. Offense. Five players in the backfield. Five-yard penalty, first down. Legal formation. You did see Quinnen Williams involved in that play. Good to see for Alabama as he was banged up early. Another one of those guys stepping into the void that is created with the annual purge of talent that comes out of this, team, this program to the NFL. Deron Payne, Deshaun Hand, another big contributor along the defensive front. Quinnen Williams. Manning, that nose tackle position, incredibly well this year. Swing to Malone. Nice move past the 25-yard line. Just on cue, Quentin Williams gets a pressure on a quick three-step timing. That's not easy to do. We looked at it a couple of times in this game. They're going to try to get the ball to their playmakers quickly. They, I think they've learned you can't have a slow-developing play. We've seen the Raging Cajuns attempt couple of multiple ball handling, a couple of ball fakes, and by then, the quarterback and or would-be runner ends up on the ground for a negative yardage play. Get it out of your hands quick. Nine-yard pickup on that last play. You saw Dix have to go out with his helmet coming off. Regas takes on the tide and might have gotten a yard against Quinnen Williams, who's a really talented first-team player for the Crimson Tide. You don't notice any difference, right, in terms of first-team talent 
than what we've seen the last few years. It's just depth that Alabama is still trying to build. Depth is the concern because some of these guys, like a Quinn and Williams, played a lot last year. They roll players throughout the defensive lineup. So it's not as if these guys have a ton of inexperience. Obviously, Patrick Sertan, incapable because he's a true freshman. But a guy like a Quinn and Williams, he's able to step in and fill in. One on two over there to the sideline to Keenan Barnes. It's incomplete. Savion Smith, you see there in coverage. We've seen a couple where they'll try the corner. We've seen a second time now, another fade ball along the sideline. Do such a good job as you see Deontay Thompson, who was coming over to help late from safety, a little bit shaken up. Might have gotten told that right arm, strangely. Either that or he got kicked right there at the end as they came down. The clear leader of Alabama's secondary this season with so much inexperience. Waddle fields that one just inside the 30. If you give him a chance to return, it's hard to bring him down. Look at this guy run all over the football field. Changing direction four times and bringing it almost to the 50. You can't ever turn your television off when he has the football. Bernsey Hawks have had some heartbreaking losses against the Aggies in that game in Jerry's world the last few years. So the Crimson Tide is ready to snap it at the 48-yard line, but I believe this one is going to come back as it looked like Jalen Waddle's knee was down when he fielded the football as they're taking another look at this. It was a knuckleball punt. Yeah, he's definitely down. You see that left knee down on the turf. Boy, he was electrifying, though, after he kneeled. And it was a strange wobbler. He kind of misjudged it as he was catching it. Did a good job of fielding that punt because it kind of knuckled its way downfield. But clearly, knee was down as he received the punt. Here's Hubert Owens. After review, the ruling is that the return man's knee was down at the 30-yard line. It'll be first and 10 from the 30 for Alabama. Please reset the game clock. 11 minutes, 54 seconds. All right, all of that for not still entertaining. It was fun to watch. <laughs> I'm sure the punt coverage unit could do without the cardiac, uh, cardiovascular exercise because that's a whole lot of chasing down. He ran 30 yards on the Alabama logo on the 50. 63 yard punt return that did count for a touchdown in the first quarter. As he is on the field at the top of your screen. Jalen Hurts with the touchdown pass to Henry Ruggs on the last drive. This is Damian Harris in the game with him for a couple. Let's get an update on Jonah Williams with Chris. Well, he is questionable to return with an ankle injury. I'm told he will be reevaluated at halftime. Uh, you're looking at one of the greatest technicians. Just so technically sound. Quiet feet, great hand placement, never gets overextended. The one knock Mike Loxley said that he has on Jonah Williams, he might be too smart. He's almost too aware on the field of what the defense is doing. Hurts under pressure. Down he goes back near the 30-yard line as he faked that one to Jacobs and Carlos Robinson, the junior from Monroe, Louisiana, on the tackle. The confusion along the front that time. And it looked as if perhaps they were trying to run an RPO. Hertz pulls it, and you have pressure right there in the middle of your offensive front. That's something that was a hallmark a season ago. The pressure percentage was slightly higher with Hertz at quarterback. Some of the processing a little bit slow. Just a fourth sack. Alabama's allowed this season, and then he loads up and throws a strike to Ruggs, who stays in there to make the catch and take the hit. Clean pocket for Hurts to throw from. He's got time. He drops one over the middle. Third time now that we've seen 
Jalen Hurts in this game. In the short time that he's been in the lineup, able to drop it in there. As you see Ruggs taking the shot. There as he comes down with Deuce Wallace, the Raging Cajuns defense. Five explosive plays for the Crimson Tide. That was 31 yards. A sophomore from Montgomery. It was a concern for Billy Napier coming into this game. Because he knew how explosive Alabama has been throughout this season. And the number of explosives his defense has allowed. That's a scary combination. And Jacobs breaking tackles inside the 30-yard line. Now, part of the reason why Jalen Hurts staying here is beneficial to him is because of Dan Enos now being in as the quarterback coach. Enos, of course, played for Nick Saban at Michigan State, was a head coach at Central Michigan, the offensive coordinator at Arkansas most recently, and Nick Saban was effusive with his praise yesterday about the ability to add Enos to his staff. As Harris goes straight ahead. It was interesting, too, because Coach Saban talked about why did he advocate so ardently to get that 10th coach. It wasn't for special teams. He wanted a quarterback coach because of the tempo element of offense now. He wanted someone that wasn't worried about calling the next play, someone who could coach his quarterbacks between snaps, no matter how fast you're going to snap off the next play. And Dan Enos has an impeccable reputation of working with his QB. We saw a lot of this the last couple of years. His hurts eludes a few and gets out of bounds near the 20-yard line. It's still unusual, right, to see those head coaches, the former head coaches on the sideline. We saw Butch Jones flash into the picture for a moment, who's an analyst on the staff, and Enos was the head coach of the Chippewas for a few years. Mike Lox Loxley, the offensive coordinator, is head coach of the Lobos of New Mexico and interim head coach of Maryland. Najee again with all kinds of daylight on the left side down near the 10-yard line. And having this kind of experience factors in heavily when you had so much turnover on your staff. You see these guys, I mean, what, what do these head coaches go and do? You know, if they are removed or transitioned from their current position, then they come to Alabama. It's like the Heisman house, where if you're a former head coach, you come to Tuscaloosa, you stay in the game, you stay sharp, maybe you learn from what the successes are here in the Alabama pro. Harris hits a Lafayette, the Louisiana Lafayette defender somehow stays on his feet for a few more. This guy was the top prospect in all of high school football from Antioch, California two seasons ago and only saw limited action last year. Still can't get over that national championship game. You've got a true freshman quarterback and Tunga Bailoa, Devontae Smith makes that catch as a true freshman. Not enough to made about Najee Harris's fourth quarter performance in that game. Comes in, fresh legged, rotated guy in there, and have him contribute already it's on this drive alone. Three different running backs having touched the football. Harris touches it again. And makes it up to the five. Had a career high 135 yards against Arkansas State. You know, a little more on what you were saying about Jalen Hurts and, and that red shirt rule. There's tremendous benefit, right, for a freshman to be able to play as many as four times and not use a year of eligibility. But the idea that Kelly Bryant could start 18 straight games at Clemson and no longer is enrolled there in school, that's going to take some getting used to. It's Crimson Tide has a second in goal at the five. Harris, look at this. Just too easy. Touchdown, Bama. A big block from Chris Owens, who came into the game to replace Jonah Williams for six. Unfortunately, another Crimson Tide player, Jedrick Willis, Wills, is on the. Yeah, that would be He's both tackles for Alabama. Jedrick Wills, who. Matt Womack, the guy that was at right tackle, manned that position last season for, Crimson, for the Crimson Tide, was in a position battle, was injured during fall camp. And Jedrick Wills has played well this season. We've already seen Jonah Williams come off. Chris Owens manning his spot at left tackle, behind whom they just ran. 
As you see Wills able to leave under his own power. This did Jonah Williams earlier, but clearly hampered at the end of that last play. Have to be the biggest concern for Coach Saban today, right? Getting out of this game with as much health as possible. Are you kidding me? What about the punt team? What about penalties? The little Debbie transition to Twinkies? There's those a lot are, going on. Those are a few things, yes. It should also factor in to Otunga Bailoa's lack of a performance in the fourth quarter. All of us already with six extra points in the game. Six drives, six touchdowns for the Crimson Tide. The most recent, Najee Harris almost walking in here in T-Town. All right, we had our list earlier on things to work on. Let's get more serious. This is Coach Saban's list. Yeah, and, and these are some legitimate areas of concern. They haven't compromised them. But two for ten penalty, two, two penalties for ten yards. They already have caused a forced fumble, albeit they didn't receive it, uh, t- recover it. 21 carries for 100 yards and three touchdowns. I would say that's pretty good. Check that box, set. yeah. Ten is the most yards gained by the Raging Cajuns. Stop the big plays and punt better. Well, they haven't punted yet. Yeah, they're yet. blowing it there. I mean, it's, at some point in time, you can't be good at some of the other things to even get an opportunity to improve on the last thing of punt. Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern, Thinking Out Loud is back again with Greg McElroy and Marcus Spears. They'll talk football and want your participation via social media throughout the show. It's also available streaming live on the ESPN app. about that Kentucky-South Carolina game tonight in Lexington. Wildcats beat the Gamecocks in William Price last year. We saw the Gamecocks last week with a convincing win over Vanderbilt, and Kentucky's ranked for the first time in 11 years. Well, they've earned it. Kentucky looks real. Now, we've seen Kentucky sprint out of the gates before to an undefeated record through their first four contests, but I think that they've got staying power this season. This is delayed. Getting just more than a yard. Well, the SEC West obviously has its favorite in Alabama. There's no doubt the SEC East in Georgia, but who's next? I think Kentucky vying for that second spot here tonight versus South Carolina. Yeah, you just saw on the screen, Biddy Snell is an animal. In his three years in Lexington has gained everyone's respect. Great. One of the best third down backs in the conference. False start. Offense, number 74, five-yard penalty, second down. True freshman, Max Mitchell, big stage versus some big men. Nico Robinson, usual starter there at left tackle. We've already seen some revolving door at the tackle position. At Alabama now, Jedrick Wills at the end of that last drive. Coming off the field, looked like he strained a hip flexor or something at the end of the touchdown run. Calais, look at that hit. Somehow he still stayed on his feet as Deontay Thompson, who was dinged up a little earlier, makes the play there. He's got a little issue with his helmet. Redshirt junior from Orange, Texas. He leads the Crimson Tide in tackles. He is more than willing in run support. You see him running down downhill. Lonnie Harrison was similar last year. Deontay Thompson, he has been able to step up and run support. According to Tosh Lupoy, the defense coordinator, he also leads the team in most film watched. Nunez on the third and 12, and the catch is underneath. Short of the first down is Diggs is there to make the tackle. They can, they know how much film these guys are watching on their iPad. They can monitor that. And according to Luke Boyd, Deontay Thompson is the, the leader on the defensive side of the ball. It's fascinating because you can, we talk about the level of competition and talent that's on this roster. When we talk to these players, they are incredibly well-versed in their craft. They are spending time in understanding what the opponent is doing and what it is that they're trying to accomplish. The Watt will get another chance here. No, their catch gets away from it. 
the Cajuns will down it just inside the 40-yard line. Bama 42 points, Louisiana 52 yards. <laughs> PB, I got something for you. Outside of the conference, Trevor Lawrence is banged up, came out of the game for Clemson. They had to go to their third quarterback there, Chase Bryce. Not Case Kelly in Bryant. point, look, redshirt rules for freshmen. Redshirt rules shouldn't be applied to these upper class. Now Tua's back in the game, and a quick pass to Devontae Smith, who tried to get free. It's a block out there by big Matt Womack. We talked about him earlier in the game. Jedrick Wills left earlier a little bit banged up. Dante Smith, quite possibly the biggest catch in the history of Alabama football. Consider that. Nine-yard completion there. A sophomore from Amy, Louisiana. Jacobs still finds the edge and gets the first down. Now, Devontae, as we mentioned, a Louisiana guy, one of many on this Crimson Tide team. Caught only seven passes all of last season. And Billy Napier gave him that nickname when he recruited him here to Tuscaloosa. And how about that middle one there? George Sanders, his barber, also a mentor to him, drives 300-plus miles from a meet to cut his hair here in Tuscaloosa. Najee Harris with the lateral quickness in the footwork. Harris dancing inside the 35 for eight. I saw him working with Jalen Waddle on the sidelines earlier. And maybe it's just through osmosis. All of a sudden you can shake like that. That's a big body that you're creating space. 6'2", 230 pounds. And he has got a little wiggle to him. Created his own blocks with a couple unblocked defenders. To Harris, plenty of time and delivers a strike to Hale to Irv Smith. That's 13 more for the big junior tight end from New Orleans. Spreading the ball around and we talked about that distribution, the ability to get the ball in the playmaker's hands outside of just one. He said it best about this style of football we're seeing today. Need the opponent to know we can run and be effective. That's what Irv Smith said about the plan today. Here's Brian Robinson on the carry, and the sophomore from Tuscaloosa gets nothing. Thursday at 9 Eastern after Auburn versus Texas A&M women's soccer, it's Marty and McGee. They have you covered with everything that's SEC. Like everything else, you can see them live on the ESPN app from anywhere. It's fueled by Gatorade. Brian Robinson who went to Hillcrest High School here in Tuscaloosa is 6'1", 221 pounds, and looks the part of a first-team tailback in college football. He's the fourth guy we've seen on the field today for the Crimson Tide. Burst of speed, eludes a tackle, and spins ahead to the 20-yard line. Michael Jaquette on the tackle. Jaquette. Converted wide receiver for the Raging Cajuns. Now playing in the secondary and a good job by their front, stretching that play out. We've seen on a couple of occasions where Alabama's able to capture the edge. Josh Jacobs earlier in this possession, that time stringing out just long enough for Jaquette to get up there along with Corey Turner to make a play. Third down, Alabama perfect in this situation so far. Tungabaloa to the end zone, in stride to Waddle. It's really early in the season. It's still late September, but you can understand why all these people are talking about Tua Tungabailoa potentially being in New York in December. Well, you take a guy who's at the center of a pretty impressive universe of talent. You've got a constellation of stars offensively, but in the middle of it is number 13. And his ability to utilize all of those weapons has been on full display so far this season. 
Sophomore from Eva Beach, Hawaii, also the holder. Throws that 20 yard strike to Waddle here. And strike is right. You know, they talk about it. He couples two things his vision and ability to feel and see the field, feels pressure, understands coverage, but also his accuracy. Strong arm, no doubt, as you see him visiting with Dan Enos on the sideline. And he is only going to get better with experience. And it's hard to improve on what is already a perfect day. Eight for eight passing. And in case you were wondering, Crimson Tide did that to the Commodores in 1990, the last year that they played Louisiana Lafayette, Raging Cajuns actually went down there to Lafayette to play in that game, played them in Birmingham, in Legion Field a couple of times in the late 80s. It's been more than 30 years since these two teams have met here in Tuscaloosa. Seven touchdowns to zero still in the first half. Coming up at halftime, you can watch the live performance of the official marching band for the University of Alabama, Million Dollar Band, on SEC Network Plus. Start streaming now on the ESPN Plus app. We've seen a combination of RPOs and traditional offense in this game, and the Crimson Tide has been equally effective. You know, in talking with Mike Loxley yesterday, he was talking about balance. Well, balance has changed a lot because you don't just call and run plays because of the after-snap options that are available to these quarterbacks. You can call a run and have a pass tagged onto it. It ends up being a pass. But it's the finesse plays versus the physical plays. That's the balance that Alabama wants to strike. And look at this. Staying on his feet is Regus past midfield. 27 yards. Defensive coordinator Tosh Lupoy running down the sideline to get back a great effort by Regas, spinning out of the tackle, keeping his balance, and getting the ball to midfield. Far their longest play of the game, and on the next play, it's all Crimson tied in the backfield as you see Christian Miller there. We've talked about it. It cannot take time. At the top of your drop at quarterback, the ball needs to come out. Otherwise, you're talking about another negative yardage play. It's a certain level of inevitability that's been established in this game where the pressure will arrive. If the ball comes out quickly, there's a chance, and we've seen that a time or two. But at the top of the drops for Nunez or Lewis, the pressure gets home. Sideline incomplete over the head of Jamarcus Bradley. Miller, fifth-year senior from Columbia, has been the contributor for years for the Crimson Tide and was big in that FSU victory at the beginning of the 2017 season. Tore his biceps in that game and did not come back until the Auburn game. He actually made his first career start, if you can believe it, last week against Texas A&M after he was named the SEC Player of the Week against Ole Miss. Third and 18. Regus somehow gets past a few Crimson Tide defenders before Miller finishes him off on what might be the last play of the first half. Well, to say that it was a complete half for Alabama, I think, is somewhat of an understatement. You don't want to get too excited over what they put together, and at the same time, it's hard to detract from what you saw from the Crimson Tide. Special teams, offensively, defensively, the only issue may very well be the injuries that were Set the game clock, three seconds. Hold that thought, Stinch. You have three more seconds of the first half Thank to you. watch, evidently. I, based on the play calling alone, I just thought that the Raging Cajuns were just going to run out the half. Apparently a timeout was called with three seconds to squeeze in one more play. I don't get it. If that's the case, you want to get one more play with three seconds. The previous play calls were curious. So Andre Nunez and 
the Raging Cajuns will go for this with only three seconds left in the half. And he'll load up. Into a sea of Crimson Tide defenders, and it's picked off. And that is, I believe, Patrick, no, Trayvon Diggs that comes out of that pile. <laughs> they had almost had an interception last week, and he gets clobbered by his teammates after celebrating this pick. So there's one more play to be proud of, Stitch. Yeah, I, I just let's squeeze in a, a gift of an interception and a kind of a curious sequence of events there at the end of the first half off what was a dominating performance by Alabama. Chris is with Coach Saban. Coach, in the first seven minutes, you put up 21 points, including a block punt and a punt return for a touchdown. What can you say about the intensity these guys came out with? Well, I'm glad the way we came out and played today. I'm really proud of our players. You know, we're trying to create an identity as a team. We want to play with more consistency. We want to play with more discipline, and I think we did that for the most part in the first half. You want to see some improvement from the run game. What have you seen in their execution? Well, we've actually tried to run the ball a little more in this game, direct runs, and um, you know, we still got to finish blocks better, but I think there's some improvement. Thank you, Coach. All right, thank you. 49 zip for the number one team in the country. Let's go to the SEC halftime report with Peter Burns, Gene Chiswick, and Chris Doring. Welcome to SEC football presented by Allstate. Another convincing first half, dominant performance by the Crimson Tide in every single phase. With Matt Stinchcomb, I'm Taylor Zarzer. You'll see Chris Budden in just a moment. Stinch, I guess the only negative of that first half where there were a few couple of injuries there to some key Crimson Tide players. Yeah, both tackles for the Crimson Tide offensively left the field. Now left the field under their own power, but Jonah Williams looked like he had some issue perhaps with his ankle. But that would be the only detraction from the first half. Let's take a look at playing with style brought to you by Belk. This is a tough choice. There's so many great performances in the first half. But let's go with Henry Ruggs, who shined a few different times. A couple of nice catches over the middle. Caught it in traffic. Took a shot. Hit in stride from Jalen Hurts, who delivered a strike downfield as he took a shot. And Henry Ruggs, one of many at wide receiver that are going to be giving defensive coordinators fits for the balance of this football season. So the Crimson Tide defense first here in the second half as and the Ragin Cajuns will start at the 25, Chris. Well, Nick Saban has an ability to get his group year after year to come out with a fire and intensity against these unranked teams. So where does that come from? A lot of the players in the coaching staff will tell you it's actually peer pressure. There is such a standard to live up to at this program that the older guys show to the younger guys so they don't want to come out flat. And then it's also the alumni base, the former players. They will text this group and tell them, don't forget, you have to play to a certain level. Even Dylan Moses told us he heard from Rashad Evans this week that said, don't let up against this group. Regis. Tied defenders don't let up there. Quinnen Williams and company are there to make the tackle. They played 60 different players, the Crimson Tide did in the first half. You see the depth that they're developing, but the leadership that's always demonstrated on the field as you see Isaiah Bugs up front, Quentin Williams, Dylan Moses, Mac Wilson. You know, they're just the latest version, a continuation of the players that preceded them. Even in the national championship game at halftime, some of the former players just shared their displeasure with their team's performance in the first half. Vegas carrying tied defenders a yard shy of the first down. Raquan Davis had called out his name today, the junior from Meridian, Mississippi. Situational football, so a third and short and a chance to get a short yardage rep and a chance to convert for the Raging Cajun offense. And they do with Elijah Mitchell receiving the football for another Raging Cajun first down. Tay Thompson, mentioned Quinnen Williams. These guys stepping in for the departed talent that now plays on Sundays. More of those from this program than any other. It is staggering the contributions.
to the NFL rosters that come out of Alabama. Mitchell gets a few more. So who are the next guys that have a chance to start at the next level? As Coach Saban says, we're having to replace so many three-year players. As you see, all of these draft picks, 77, 26 in the first round, 12 selected last year. We'll go through a few of these here after this play. On the reverse... Jamal Bell changes field and goes back to midfield. As Trayvon Diggs has his helmet fly off and help make the tackle there. It's a gain of seven. Nice drive so far to open up the second half. Chris was talking about how do you maintain your edge, especially in a near 50-point ball game and only two quarters of play. So far, the Raging Cajuns asserting themselves a bit here, especially with their ground game. Staying on the ground with Mitchell for a couple. Deontay Thompson is a junior in the secondary. Mac Wilson, a junior at linebacker, as is Anthony Jennings. And then on the line, we showed Raekwon Davis a, a few plays ago. Those are three or four juniors that will have a decision to make at the end of the season. Isaiah Bugs, if he keeps putting together performances like he did last week versus Texas A&M. Quiet Fury, I think the local headline was for Bucks. First throw of the second half is picked off. In stride, that's Xavier McKinney making the interception. Nunez trying to throw under pressure on the run to his right. Took a shot from Mac Wilson as he releases this pass. You see number 30 tracking upfield quickly, beats the block, gets a shot on Nunez. Ill-advised. And McKinney able to come up with yet another interception on the season. Basically a brand new secondary, nine interceptions. Well, this stretch is remarkable since Nick Saban came to the capstone with the five national championships, but eerily similar to the run that Coach Bryant went on between 1971 and 1982. More national titles far less conference titles and basically the same winning percentage. So, you've been a Crimson Tide fan since the turn of the 1970s. You've sort of seen this before as Jalen Hurts hands off to Najee Harris. And as you said in the open of the show, Matt, there are only two coaches in the history of the game that have six national championships, and they both coached here. They both coached here. That's the, And the only thing that Coach Saban hasn't done is one, win six national championships at Alabama. Something that obviously the Bear was able to accomplish during his quarter of a century on the sidelines here in Tuscaloosa. Toss to Harris. And patient running payoff as he tiptoes the sideline and is out of bounds near the 40. Number 22 for Alabama, his balance is pretty impressive. Also, obviously, a very elusive football player, but the tightrope, when you've got that much momentum and you're dancing around to try to create your own space, we saw it earlier at the end of the second quarter. Nearly seven yards a touch for Najee Harris. At 30 there. Need him again. Cuts it back for a few more. So again, Jalen Hurts playing in his fifth game today as the backup quarterback in 2018 after 28 starts the last two years, 26-2 and two as a starting quarterback. And it's significant because of the news we heard about Kelly Bryant, who was the opposing quarterback in last year's Sugar Bowl. Bryant intending to transfer earlier this week. Second and six run, Brian Robinson might have gotten a yard. So while Bryant leaves, Trevor Lawrence, the starting quarterback for Clemson, is out for the rest of the game today against Syracuse with a concussion. So their third string quarterback, Chase Bryce, is playing today. Uh, it's just, I think it's a case study of the impact of this redshirt rule and a decision that I'm sure Kelly Bryant is sitting there thinking, yeah, it might have been a slap in the face. But this is exactly why you stick around. A chance to play with your teammates and compete. Jalen Hurts 
deciding to do that. The redshirt rule. This pass is completed to Ruggs for a first down. You know, in conversations even yesterday where traditionally you think of a redshirt, you redshirt so that you can evaluate a new player. A redshirt freshman, right? You think about that's when that redshirt year of eligibility where you're preserving that year of eligibility as a new player. But what we're seeing already with the loosening of transfer rules and the four game window, you've got veteran players, guys that have been in programs for two or three years, you call a program hostage and say, if I don't play more than I transfer, I don't, I don't know how that is supposed to look. But you have guys also afforded a chance to make what would otherwise be maybe a bad decision. Kelly Bryant, you had a chance to stick around with that team. You're, you're playing and taking snaps for Clemson right now. They, they're losing, by the way, 16-7 to to Syracuse at halftime in Clemson. Nine-yard carry there for Brian Robinson plowing ahead here. And what now is a second and inside two. Snap. That play was tough to develop. Nice play from the backside. Dowell coming in, closing. So let me ask you, Stinch, it. I don't know what Kelly Bryant's plans will be now, but if you're a Clemson player, if he all of a sudden says, okay, wait a minute, I, I'm back, what would you say? No way. No way. I mean, you're either on the team or you aren't. Sorry, it can't be. And, and I'd be shocked if he even would suggest it. If Kelly Bryant said, look, at this point in time, if you were offended to that extent that you want to transfer because you're no longer the starter, I can't imagine this being enough to say you want to come back to your team. Jalen Hurts showing off this athleticism for three years in T-Town. That helped him win 14 straight games. His freshman season put away LSU down in Tiger Stadium and scored what we thought might be the game-winning touchdown in the national championship game two years ago. Yeah, it just uh, he's such a tremendous athlete. Nice pickup by Brian Robinson. He brought two defenders off of the edge from the left side of the formation and hurts doing as you mentioned taylor what he has done so well during his career here at tuscaloosa making a positive play out of what have, could have been a tackle for loss robinson so strong inside the 10 should see some of Mac Jones today too, the redshirt freshman quarterback from Jacksonville, Florida, who has played in three games so far this season as we have a raging Cajun down on the field. Crimson Tide rolling and about to score again here in Tuscaloosa on a warm Saturday. Let's learn a little more about this guy, Brian Robinson, Jr., from right here in Tuscaloosa. Played his high school football at Hillcrest High School. I totally agree with number two. And I'm afraid of snakes as well. But the favorite meal of the year is Thanksgiving. <laughs> I, I, the only thing I would add is my favorite meal might be the day after Thanksgiving, eating more Thanksgiving. You just don't get enough round one? Is that what it is? Yeah. Well, there's a sandwich included usually on Friday. Yeah, it does kind of season, right? It takes a little bit of time. Well, spaghetti's better than the second day. So is that turkey and dressing. Robinson's sixth carry of the day. Bulldozes his way to the six. We talk about the way the Crimson Tide has been able not only to generate turnovers, but generate points off of turnovers. They've done it all season long. Here's a chance to continue to do that. The only turnover, incidentally, that they weren't able to capitalize on, either directly by running, returning it for a touchdown or scoring on the ensuing offensive possession was that interception right at the end of the first half. Here's a chance to capitalize on the pick here in the second half. They can score in under a minute, done it 11 times. And that ball incomplete. To Jerry Judy, dangerous pass there by Hertz. They can also milk the clock. This is the 12th play upcoming after this incompletion. Dangerous indeed. Ball a little bit high in Jaquette coming up. Former receivers we mentioned breaking on that ball and enough to break up the would be reception to Judy. This is a chip shot for Bullivis. Four for five 
on the season. Had that one miss, the short one, inside 40 yards in Oxford. Made a 47-yarder against the Aggies last week. And this one is no good. 24-yard miss with six minutes left in the third quarter. He's perfect, 13-0 against former assistants. Beat Coach Mack three times. Derek Dooley in those orange pants three times. Coach D twice. Still don't know if he's recovered from that Capital One Bowl. Coach Boom twice. Jimbo last week and last year. Two different uniforms. Kirby, heartbreaking fashion for the dogs. He's 13-0. We'll be 14-0 after beating Coach Napier today against former assistants. It's a nice run by Trey Raggis, who gets just past the 25-yard line. It's well done. <laughs> Video game theme. Don't you just see him putting in his initials with the joystick at the end so that he can have the high score? I just love that 1980s sound. I miss it, yeah. A little ColecoVision. <laughs> friends at Atari for Nintendo and Sega took over the world. The Zarzer and Stinchcombe's wheelhouse right there as children. <laughs> Regis give and nearer the first down. It really is remarkable that he's 14 and 0, going to be against former assistants. And you think about some of those games, the, the game against Kirby last year. He'll play Coach Pruitt in a couple of weeks, so he'll have a chance to extend that even further. And who knows? Maybe he's on a collision coach to meet Coach Smart for Saturday in December as well. And not just the, sh the sheer number of coaches that are out there that are now head coaches, but the programs where they're coaching. There's opportunity. These are established programs that are have just been incapable of defeating what could be considered a mentor, certainly their former head coach on the staff on which they serve. It is just a, it's a pretty staggering feat. It would be one thing. If they were transferring, if they were taking jobs at lesser schools, of maybe perhaps a group of five, FCS, we're talking about established Power Five programs, and they still have not been able to solve the riddle. Second and seven. Nice pass out of the backfield by Levi Lewis caught by Elijah Mitchell. It's a first down for the Ragin' Cajuns. Not only has Coach Saban beaten all these former assistants, he's lost a bunch of them. First season in Tuscaloosa after the year, Kevin Steele left the program. Uh, Major Applewhite as well. He had Coach McElwain a, a few years later. Doug Nussmeyer, Lane Kiffin. Mitch and Kirby Smart, Jeremy Pruitt. Leaving at the end of the last season, as did Brian Dable. And he can't make the tackle there. And a couple of teammates come up to rally to make it on Keenan Barnes. But the beat has gone on. If not, the program's gotten better after each of those guys left. And the question is, how can you endure that much turnover, that much turbulence on your staff where it's a constant influx and outflux is coming in in and out players obviously leaving early players going to the next level players leaving after their third year of eligibility and then coaches and yet they've been able to maintain their identity something coach say we talked about at the end of the first half Calais. tackled by raekwon davis third down and i think it's a function of the players you look at really good programs, they've got leadership from the coaching staff. You look at great programs, they've got leadership in the locker room. You know, the accountability and the consistency that characterizes this program is a function of the expectations and the standard that these players themselves, either they adopt as freshmen and young players, and then they grow into it over the course of their time here in Tuscaloosa, and they're going to hold their teammates to that standard as well. It's a third and eight as Lewis will sprint out. Incomplete one hopper in front of his intended receiver as McKinney was in the backfield again. Now, many Bama fans believe that 
the current coordinators could be on staff for quite some time, but that's Tosh Lupoy there. Maybe he's the next potential head coach in college football. Bay Area guy that played at De La Salle out in California, played for the Bears, then coached at Washington. Came to spring practice four years ago just trying to talk shop, learn from Coach Saban, ultimately was hired and the defensive coordinator for the top program in the country. Waddle with the fair catch at the 11. Coming up tonight at 7.30, South Carolina takes on number 17, Kentucky, in our SEC Saturday night matchup presented by Holiday Inn Express. Let's see what Jordan Rogers has to say. I think we all found out Benny Snell and this Kentucky football team is the real deal running the football. If there's one area of concern, as good as this defense has been, it hasn't been great on third down. And Jake Bentley is as good as it gets at diagnosing coverage and blitz. This game will be won and lost on the outside on third down. Can't wait to watch that one tonight. Alabama fans been waiting to see more of this guy. All the talk about Tua and Jalen. Mac Jones is a highly sought after high school player that was committed to Kentucky for quite some time. He hands it off to Brian Robinson running over defenders, but there is a flag down. Holding offense number 87. Half the distance to the goal. First down. Hold on Miller Forrestall, the backup tight end. Max, a redshirt freshman from Jacksonville, Florida. Hasn't had many opportunities in a passing situation yet this season. Should have some here. We've got plenty of time for it, for sure, and especially when you've got a holding penalty to start this possession. You're going to have to try to climb out the shadow of your goalpost with these current field positions. And there's his second completion. Hitting Waddle in stride, and watch out. This could go all the way. 95 yards. Pretty efficient for Mac Jones. It's downhill from here, kid. You hit Waddle in stride. We've already seen number 17 for Alabama in this game. He doesn't need a lot of space to make you pay. Takes it all the way. At, you know, holding penalty, if nothing else, gives Waddle a chance to pad his stats. Keep Mac Jones on the field to hold here for Bolivis. And the extra point is good. All three Bama quarterbacks have thrown a touchdown today. Mac Jones throws his first of his career to the high flyer, the magic man, Jalen Waddle. Welcome to SEC football presented by Allstate. Alabama with eight touchdowns so far in this game, rolling against the Ragin' Cajuns from Lafayette, Louisiana. Crimson Tide with a 94-yard touchdown pass from Mac Jones to Jalen Waddle. What do you think of Waddle's performance so far today, Stinch? Pretty good? I would say it's it's above average. Well, well above average. <laughs> Three-yard punt return and then takes that one 94 yards to the house. You see 138 yards receiving. Over 200 all-purpose yards in this game. Lay, who is tackled just past the 20-yard line. Here's what we have in the Southeastern Conference tonight. There's a lot of emotion at play here when Mullen gets back down in Starkville. Excited about the opportunities while you play at the Southeastern Conference. Touchdown! How about that? Benny Snell is fourth touchdown of the night. Oh, Snell, yeah! Mullen Bowl at 6 Eastern on ESPN. Gamecocks and Wildcats on SEC Network and Rebels and the LSU Tigers late tonight on ESPN. It's the throw there is in stride. Andre Nunez finding Keenan Barnes with a completion up to the 44-yard line. It's 23 yards. Now, I, don't, I don't get some of the, uh, the vitriol 
towards Coach Mullen in, in Starkville. This, uh, I mean, this is a guy that did a phenomenal job in that program and enjoyed a great deal of success. It seems like there's a great deal of animus. The leg is past midfield. There is, and nine years, best winning percentage of anyone that coached there more than five years, second winning as coach in the history of the program. Would have been number one by the end of this season, but I, I guess the idea is we don't want to be your stepping stone. So maybe that's part of the reason why they're frustrated he moved on, but certainly left behind a, a great program as Elijah Mitchell takes that hand off. Yeah, well, wh whether it's warranted sentiment or not, there's no doubt they're going to use that to fuel the fire. And Mississippi State, who's licking its wounds after losing to Kentucky last week, a chance to kind of get back on track on their season. And here right now, albeit versus some second line defenders, three first downs in the entire first half for the Raging Cajuns. Now six here in the second half. End of the third quarter, Crimson Tide blowing out Louisiana Lafayette today, 56-0, no different than what they did in their first four games. Doesn't matter who they play. Welcome back to Tuscaloosa. Start of the fourth quarter, Alabama leads at 56 to nothing. Billy Napier takes a lot of his motivation as a head coach from his father, Bill Napier, who was a longtime high school football coach in North Georgia. Bill Napier passed away a year ago this past Wednesday from ALS. He actually first learned of the diagnosis when his son Billy was on Alabama's staff. When I asked Billy this week what he wants to emulate from his father, he said his father's team was toughness. They overachieved. They were known for their effort. They were difficult to defend. And he says, most of all, people would look at that sideline and say, how are they doing that? Isaac Mitchell takes it near the 40-yard line and had a chance to visit with Coach Napier before the game on the field. And he had some tears in his eyes thinking about this opportunity today to be the head coach against Alabama. And visiting with Coach Saban, the other night on his radio show, he told me that the first thing reason he allowed Billy to come here and interview for an opportunity was because of the respect that Coach Saban carried for his father. He's such a successful high school football coach. Elijah Mitchell breaking tackles with stiff arms. And look at this. Near the goal line, he'll be marked out at the one. That's a 40-yard run. Joshua McMillan preventing the touchdown. You mentioned the stiff arm, and at the end of this run, I don't know, from that look at it, was he out of bounds before this ball breaks the plane? Another look. Ball's in his left arm. You see, as the Joshua McMillan got there towards the end, as it is, an opportunity for the Raging Cajuns to get on the board. Regus at the goal line, touchdown. And the Raging Cajuns score for the first time today. It was a second effort for Regus. As he was met on about the one-yard line, we mentioned he is a powerful back. You see right here, two defenders, a chance to deny the end zone. You see that ball broke the plane. For the first time in the entire game, Raging Cage, it's off of the big run by Mitchell. And we get in the end zone. And the extra point by Cal Fow is good. That is just the second rushing touchdown. The Crimson Tide has allowed all season. All right, these are my top five game-winning plays in national championship history. Barry Krause, get in there. Goal line stand, Tide wins the title. Nebraska for the title, no good. Miami wins it. And then two years ago, close your eyes, Tide fans. Watson to Renfro, that's number three on my list. Number two, Tua to Smitty. Tide beat the dogs, but this has got to be number one. Vince 
Young scores. Texas beats the Trojans back in the 2005 season. Let me have it. Let the debate begin. What about the couple of plays that I left off there? Jameis Winston, the Elvin Benjamin might be on the list. And how about this? Breaking free is Brian Robinson. He gets past midfield. Even when you kick it to an up back tied as a good return, that was 33 yards. Yeah, I got to tell you, just in looking at those, man, the two of the Smitty, that was about as dramatic a victory as you could ever put together. The fact that it was in overtime, the circumstances, after you take a snack, snack second 26, and nobody's thinking touchdown. And, and it was just so immediate. There might not be a more abrupt ending to a national title game than that. It was, it was shocking. I'm standing. I happened to be standing on the Georgia sideline when it happened, and Nick Chubb and Sony Michelle and the, just the heartbreak they had on their face. Robinson picks up where he left off inside the 40-yard line for 12 more. Every game this season over 500 yards. Is that good? That's the longest streak ever since they started playing football here in 1892. Robinson plows his way near the 30. So, you know, you look, you go back to what Coach Saban was saying he wanted to accomplish in this game. And ultimately, all of those things add up to, I want to be as focused as we possibly can be towards playing to our standard. Now, everyone will talk about this. I've never heard the word standard used more than what we heard yesterday in our meetings. Coaches, players. We play to a standard around here. We have a standard. This kid's playing to our standard. This kid's playing to a standard that we hold for each other. And you look at the penalties, you talk about the penalties, the punt team, the better tackling, the no explosive plays, the run the football with authority, like we're seeing here. This is what they were talking about. In the situational football, which was the area of improvement specifically for Tua Tungavaloa, where he wants better awareness out of his quarterback. They were able to check a lot of these boxes. It doesn't mean you just check it and they stay checked. It'll continue to improve. But they've been able to address quite a few here in this contest. You think of the way they put that LSU game away two years ago. I guess that's actually three years ago now in, in Tuscaloosa. The last nine minutes of the game, they ran the clock out. They want to have that ability to do that again. First look today at Ronnie Clark standing behind Matt Jones. And here's Clark. Jones took a bad snap there. Ronnie's a fifth-year player who's had five carries now on the season. Four yards after that carry, and now it's Jerome Ford who will be the sixth tailback into the game, the true freshman from Sefner, Florida. You know, the guys that don't like this rotation are the equipment managers. Because now you just got more decals and helmets you got to polish up. Some of these guys, you don't see any playing time. You just trot them out in the next game. Eight different ball carrier today. And Ford is inside the 15-yard line. Yep. See, so now look. So look at his helmet. So now they're going to have to do something. He's going to have some mark on there, some raging Cajun red. Somewhere amongst the crimson, the equipment guys are over there going, golly, it's just, it's just another lid. <laughs> Something else i got to shine up. See that depth that's out here. Just keep rolling guys in and continue to gain positive yards. Jones slings another one, but it's dropped. That was Derek Keefe who had the block punt earlier in the game. Haven't seen that often in this game. Not a lot of catchable balls that end up on the ground. Mac Jones, we mentioned, hadn't seen a lot of throwing opportunities in his time. But for all three quarterbacks that we've seen, 13 of 16 on their targets, only three drops in this game. This could be a big kick for Bullivus to get some confidence back after missing that 24-yarder. 
And this one hits the post. I got an idea what's going to be on his list next week for areas of improvement. Make a field goal. SEC Network Football is presented by Allstate. Are you in good hands? For about 40 years, you walk around this campus in this stadium, and outside of Crimson, the next thing you see is Houndstooth everywhere. As Coach Bryant left his mark on this great facility. Meanwhile, the current head coach, Nick Saban, continues to have conversations with the kickers as he stops Joseph Bullivus there to have a little quick word with him as Regis takes the carry for a few more years. And I know it's infuriating for Alabama fans to see their program be this successful and have so many issues in the kicking game in the last decade or so. Andy Papanastos misses the field goal to win the national championship last year. They started the season by using Austin Jones, who we may see again at some point, and now using Bolivis. Straight ahead goes Regis into the Alabama secondary. It's over past the 35-yard line. Well, you can see Alabama misaligned. Jamie Mosley trying to get all the way to the opposite side of the formation. One of the things that the coaches talked about on defense especially was communication. The middle of the field, it comes from your inside linebackers, your safeties, and that it has improved week over week here with some subs in. Miscommunication there. Mitchell, near the 45, you just saw it on the screen. But Regus is at 99 yards. It did allow Kellen Mond to run over 100 yards in the first half last week as a quarterback. Rare to see a, a running back have this kind of success against the Crimson Tide. Mitchell ripped off a, a pretty nice run. You, know, you could include those, and I'm sure there will be quartered into a, an explosive play category. Depending on how they're going to categorize that, one of the boxes that the coaching staff wanted to address. No explosive plays. Obviously, rushing doesn't require as many yards to be considered an explosive. But you've seen that here in the second half the Rage of Cajun offense. Much more success in the second half in terms of moving the chains. You see Tosh Lupoy, the defensive coordinator for the Crimson Tide. LA to the 45 yard line. Another thing that Coach Saban mentioned the other night to me, Stinch, is that he was doing some research on Nolan Richardson, the national championship winning basketball coach from Arkansas, and his 40 minutes of hell mission that he had when he was the coach there to play as hard as you can for all 40 minutes. And in this case, in football, he still is searching that for that from his team. It's 56 to 7. He's blowing out the competition, but if the standard is to win a national championship, he still feels his team needs to be more efficient for four quarters. As you see the tackle for loss there by Jamie Mosley. Well, if that's the goal, then maybe he should pull some of their opponents that they played this year. Because I'd be curious to see how they would characterize their experience playing Alabama. I would think that it would approximate that standard doesn't seem like it's a relatively enjoyable experience. <laughs> to say the least. Arkansas is the next one, and that is on the road in Fayetteville next Saturday at 11 a.m. Central Time. And this is Regis over 100 yards now, and with another Ragin' Cajun first down. Tariq McDonald making that tackle. And you can believe that this is going to come up. That the defenders on that side of the ball are going to point out you know, they will not have to have the coaches say, hey, oh, and by the way, it was a 100-yard rusher. 
this past week again. And I'm sure that that will also chap some of the defenders. Back-to-back -back weeks with a 100-yard rusher on the ground. Mitchell inside near the 25-yard line. Monday at 7 Eastern, Thinking Out Loud is back with Greg McElroy and Marcus Spears. We'll talk football and want your participation via social media throughout the show. It's also streaming live on the ESPN app. Marcus there for SEC Nation today, and GMAC's got the call with Dave Pash and Tom Luganville tonight on ESPN at 6 Eastern time in the Mullen Bowl, Florida and Mississippi State. First down and a rare throw by Nunez hitting Raheem Malone for nine more. Nice catch by Malone in traffic. Not only came up with that catch, landed on his feet and was trying to torque towards the first down mark. Billy Napier, he was talking about his father and how he wanted his team to be characterized. They were finally able to get into the end zone, yes. But to see his players, frontline players, still competing at the end. Iabi Anoma in the backfield, the freshman from Baltimore, Maryland, who flashed some great play last week in the win against Texas A&M. You see a little bit more on Anoma here, a high school basketball player that dreamed of playing in the NBA. He's up to 245. Two years ago, he weighed 195. Oh, Fortnite junkie. Look at that. 50 sacks, by the way, stench in two years of high school football. Mike Loxley was the first to notice him. As Nunez will throw a third and three and wide open for the touchdown is Jamarcus Bradley. As he gets behind Jared Maiden. That's a couple for Maiden. Maiden was on the uh, receiving end of the Elijah Mitchell stiff arm. Now in coverage versus Jamarcus Bradley. A couple of scores now for the Raging Cajuns. They are 12 for 12 this season in the red zone, all 12 times scoring a touchdown. Impressive second half from Billy Napier and the Ragin' Cajuns outscoring the Crimson Tide 14 to 7 in the second frame. Raging Cajuns with a couple of touchdowns in the second half. Let's go back to the studio with Peter Burns for an update on Clemson Syracuse with DirecTV. More for your college football thing. That is a big wow there, PB. Chase Bryce, their third string quarterback playing after Trevor Lawrence had the concussion and Kelly Bryant transferred out of the program this week. So kick going out of bounds and Alabama will get better field position because Free of kick it. Kick out of bounds, kicking team. Receiving team has chosen to take the ball to the 35 yard line. First down, media timeout. Crimson Tide back on offense in just a moment. And now let's look at today's Capital One pivotal performance, a complete performance from the ground game today. And a well-rounded one at that. You've got multiple contributors, Joshua Jacobs, Najee Harris, among them. But what Alabama wanted to do was get back to a physical run game, one where you're not going to have passes tagged on. Turn around, hand the football off, get downhill. And see if you can't establish that identity in the ball game. They did it early, and they did it late. Here in the second half, it's been a little bit derailed, but I think the message was not only sent over the course of this week, but well received here on Saturday. Brian Robinson with another nice carry is Jocks Boudreaux makes the tackle. 
25 yards rushing for the Crimson Tide today. They do not have a 100-yard rusher. That's because they have too many options. They only had one this season as Damian Harris went over 100 yards a few weeks ago. Robinson again he gets tripped up. Short of the first down. Boudreaux there again. Talk about these running backs. Mike Loxley talked about it. that was the strength of this football team, he felt like offensively. And that was something that you know you, you can look at the stat sheet and think, oh, they're getting away from the run. And the challenge is, and Coach Saban touched on this, you've got a pass tagged on to your run call. You've got a defensive look where it makes a lot more sense to pull it and throw it than they've been doing that. The problem is that takes a little bit of the edge off of your blocking up front. You guys, they can run, and they're seeing passes going over their head, those offensive linemen. So they might take their foot off the gas just a little bit on some of the double teams, and some of the up front movement that they're trying to get established. And in this game, you tell a concerted effort Keep it on the ground, call this run, run the run, regardless of look, and see if you can't get positive yardage. They were able to do that. See the offensive lineman up front, Brian Robinson, with another nice carry to move the chains as they let the clock continue to run. Jerome Ford is in the game now. Follows a sea of Alabama blockers inside the 40-yard line down near the 35. Have you? It's a ninth different rusher today for Jerome, or eighth rather, a different rusher for Alabama. As Booker made the tackle there, 13-yard rush for Ford. Chris Owens came in earlier this game, left tackle. Jonah Williams first went down. Now the center of the Alabama offensive front, number 79, showing some of that versatility that he has, probably understanding of the offense as well as owing to his insertion into the lineup when Williams went down. And look at Ford Gasham again as he's out of bounds near the 20 yard line. If you liked all of our bio blasts that we've done today on the Crimson Tide, have you learned something? Thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I think, Fortnite enthusiast. I, I think you that. might like this one. Jalen Armour Davis. Now he unfortunately oh, okay. had an injury a couple weeks ago before the Arkansas State game. Now he's from Mobile, Alabama. Won the 5A state championship and he's got to be a future St. Paul Saint right. uh, Hall of Famer. Sure. There's some others that are Alongside, in the home. Oh, and uh Taylor uh, Suarez, how do you say that? Suarez. Okay. I'd like to meet that dude. Five for five in the Mobile references. This one took Hold a little on. creativity yeah. this, this week. 54 seconds to do it. Ronnie Clark to the 15-yard line. I'm sure you hope for a speedy return for Armour Davis. I do, and that was. That was really unfortunate in warm-ups for the Arkansas State game, and he's one of the guys they were hoping for to count on in the secondary this season. So that with that carry, that's a season-high 608 total yards now for the Crimson Tide today on what should be the final play of the game with Clark getting the handoff and tackled at the 15-yard line. Met in the backfield there by Braylon Trahan, and that's it. Alabama hangs 56 on the Raging Cajuns who fought hard for 60 minutes with old friend Billy Napier coming back to Tuscaloosa today. It was about as complete a first half as you could have wanted. Got a little bumpy in the second half, but yet another impressive victory for the time. And Coach is with Chris. Coach, you challenged your team to come out and play with some pride. How did you think they responded? I thought we played really well in the first half. You know, you like to finish games a little better, but we had an opportunity to play a lot of players, which, you know, is great for team morale, and we're happy to be able to do it. Sometimes you like to see them play a little better. When Jalen came out today, his fifth game, he got a standing ovation from the crowd. What can you say about the way that he's handled this situation this year? Well, you know, Jalen's a first-class guy. He's a really good player. He won a lot of games around here for us, and 
I think he respects the program, and we certainly have a tremendous amount of respect for him. And uh, he's done a wonderful job, and he's a great team player. Thank you, Coach. All right, thank you. Nick Saban, 5-0, and oh, number one in the country after a 56-14 victory today. SEC Now is next with Peter Burns, Gene Chizik, and Chris Doring.